In this video, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know to start solving reinforcement learning problems with policy gradient methods. I'm going to give you the algorithm and the implementation details up front, and then we'll go into how it all works and why you would want to do it. Let's get to it. So here's a basic idea behind policy gradient methods. A policy is just a probability distribution the agent uses to pick actions. So we use a deep neural network to approximate the agent's policy. The network takes observations of the environment as input and outputs actions selected according to a softmax activation function. Next, generate an episode and keep track of the states, actions, and rewards in the agent's memory. At the end of each episode, go back through these states, actions, and rewards and compete and compute the discounted future returns at each time step. Use those returns as weights and the actions the agent took as labels to perform backpropagation and update the weights of your deep neural network. Then just repeat until you have a kick-ass agent. Simple, yeah? So now we know the what. Let's unpack how all this works and why it's something worth doing. Remember, with reinforcement learning, we're trying to maximize the agent's performance over time. Let's say the agent's performance is characterized by some function, j, and it's a function of the weights, theta, of the deep neural network. So our update rule for theta is that the new theta equals the old theta plus some learning rate times the gradient of that performance metric. Note that we want to increase performance over time, so this is technically gradient ascent instead of gradient descent. The gradient of this performance metric is going to be proportional to a sum over states for the amount of time we spend in any given state and a sum over actions for the value of the state action pairs and the gradient of the policy, where of course the policy is just the probability of taking each action given we're in some state. This is really an expectation value, and after a little manipulation, we arrive at the following expression. When you plug that into the update rule for theta, you get this other expression. There are two important features here. This g sub t term is the discounted future returns we referenced in the opening, and this gradient of the policy divided by the policy is a vector that tells us the direction in policy space that maximizes the chance that we repeat the action a sub t. When you multiply the two, you get a vector that increases the probability of taking actions with high expected future returns. This is precisely how the agent learns over time and what makes policy gradient methods so powerful. This is called the reinforce algorithm, by the way. If we think about this long enough, some problems start to appear. For one, it doesn't seem very sample efficient. At the top of each episode, we reset the agent's memory so it effectively discards all its previous experience. Aside from the new weights that parameterize its policy, it's kind of starting from scratch after every time it learns. Worse yet, if the agent has some big probability of selecting any action in any given state, how can we control the variation between the episodes? For large state spaces, aren't there way too many combinations to consider? Well, that's actually a non-trivial problem with policy gradient methods, and part of the reason our agent wasn't so great at space invaders. Obviously, no reinforcement learning method is going to be perfect, and we'll get to the solution to both of these problems here in a minute. But first, let's talk about why we would want to use policy gradients at all, given these shortcomings. The policy gradient method is a pretty different approach to reinforcement learning. Many reinforcement learning algorithms, like deep Q learning for instance, rely on estimating the value of a state or state action pair. In other words, the agent wants to know how valuable each state is so that its epsilon greedy policy can let it select the action that leads to the most valuable states. The agent repeats this process over and over, occasionally choosing random actions to see if it's missing something. The intuition behind epsilon greedy action selection is really straightforward. Figure out what the best action is and take it. Sometimes do other stuff to make sure you're not wildly wrong. Okay, that makes sense, but this assumes that you can accurately learn the action value function to begin with. In many cases, the value or action value function is incredibly complex and really difficult to learn on realistic timescales. In some cases, the optimal policy itself may be much simpler and therefore easier to approximate. 
This means the policy grading agent can learn to beat certain environments much more quickly than if it relied on an algorithm like deep Q learning. Another thing that makes policy grading methods attractive is, what if the optimal policy is actually deterministic? In really simple environments with an obvious deterministic policy, like our grid world example, keeping a finite epsilon means that you keep on exploring even after you found the best possible solution. Obviously, this is suboptimal. For more complex environments, the optimal policy may very well be deterministic, but perhaps it's not so obvious and you can't guess at it beforehand. In that case, one could argue that deep Q learning would be great because you can always decrease the exploration factor epsilon over time and allow the agent to settle on a purely greedy strategy. This is certainly true, but how can we know how quickly to decrease epsilon? The beauty of policy gradients is that even though they are stochastic, they can approach a deterministic policy over time. Actions that are optimal will be selected more frequently, and this will create a sort of momentum that drives the agent towards that optimal deterministic policy. This really isn't feasible in action value algorithms that rely on epsilon greedy or its variations. So what about its shortcomings? As we said earlier, there are really big variations between episodes, since each time the agent visits a state, it can choose a different action, which leads to radically different future returns. The agent also doesn't make very good use of its prior experience since it discards them after each time it learns. While they seem like showstoppers, they have some pretty straightforward solutions. To deal with the variance between episodes, we want to scale our rewards by some baseline. The simplest baseline to use is the average reward from the episode, and we can further normalize the g-factor by dividing by the standard deviation of those rewards. This helps control the variance in the returns so that we don't end up with wildly different step sizes when we, when we perform our update to the weights of the deep neural network. Dealing with the sample inefficiency is even easier. While it's possible to update the weights of the neural net after each episode, nothing says this has to be the case. We can let the agent play a batch of games so that it has a chance to visit a state more than once before we update the weights for our network. This introduces an additional hyperparameter, which is the batch size for our updates, but the trade-off is that we end up with a much faster convergence to a good policy. Now, it may seem obvious, but increasing the batch size is what allowed me to go from no learning at all in Space Invaders with policy gradients to something that actually learns how to improve its gameplay. So that's policy gradient learning in a nutshell. We're using a deep neural network to approximate the agent's policy and then using gradient ascent to choose actions that result in larger returns. It may be sample inefficient and have issues with scaling the returns, but we can deal with these problems to make policy gradients competitive with other reinforcement learning algorithms like DQ learning. If you've made it this far, check out the video where I implement policy gradients in TensorFlow. If you like the video, make sure to like the video, subscribe, comment down below, and I'll see you in the next video.